Welcome. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the International Organization for Peace and Social Justice. Thank you for your uh, being here. So participation is uh, great. So uh, my name is Kyle Apps. I am the Executive Director of the International Committee on Nigeria, ICON, who are uh, collaborators, partners, and one and the same as PSJ. So I thank you for this opportunity and this ability to um, share. Uh, my presentation today is mainly on data, if you can believe it, uh, but I'll be using our data report that came out recently, the past few months, that we'll be using that as my, uh, my premise, as well as just fallback, uh, as I explained some issues on data that we uh, uh, encountered as we prepared and printed this report and, and subsequently shared it out. The title of the, uh, the report, the data report that we combined, uh, compiled with uh, PSJ, ICON and PSJ together is called Nigeria's Silent Slaughter, Genocide in Nigeria and the Implications for the International Community. The purpose of this Nigeria's Silent Slaughter data report is we want to be a voice for those in Nigeria who have been silenced. Ultimately, there's atrocities and human rights violations that are occurring every day. Uh, our main focus is to demonstrate demonstrate this genocide in Nigeria. Uh, and we looked at the past 20 years from January 1st, 2000 to January 31st, 2020. Um, so that was our focus, that was our timeline for that. So the Silent Slaughter data report, of course, the, the who, what, where, why, and when, um, the WHO, uh, International Committee on Nigeria, as I said, and PSJ, International Organization for Peace Building and Social Justice, were the partners. Uh, the what, we compiled narrative um, uh, interviews, uh, documentation, we compiled reports from various individuals as well as organizations, as well as governments. The Benue State and Taraba State governors uh, supplied reports from their, their official departments. We had a legal uh, expert give a legal case, legal brief in the introduction on, on the case for Nigeria's genocide. And of course, we used data uh, incidents and atro atrocities to, to map things out as well as chart uh, numerical values. Where again, this is in Nigeria, uh, why to be a voice to those who have been silenced. Uh, of course, these atrocities and human rights violations, as I said before, are occurring every day. And again, January 1st through January 31st, 2020. So the contents kind of describe some of that just in the previous slide. Uh, we had some prominent voices who give forwards, Representative Frank Wolf, who started the uh, International Religious Freedom uh, agenda here in the US through Congress, uh, Archbishop or Bishop Ben Kwashi you know, from Joss Anglican, uh, and Baroness uh, Carolyn Cox. Uh, we had, we've had asks, asks and expectations that we shared that we wanted to bring forward to, to not just have it a document, but actually say, this is what we're asking and this is what we expect to be done. We uh, said a legal brief uh, by a notable Nigerian uh, legal expert. We had contributions on genocide from Dr. Greg Stanton of Genocide Watch and uh, attorney Ann Bowalda of the Jubilee Campaign. We had maps and charts. We've, we use testimonies of victims, as I mentioned, Leah Sharibu, Chibok Girls, Fulani attacks, several martyrs. Um, incidents reports, as I mentioned, the Benue State Government, Taraba State Government, international recognition of the Nigerian situation, uh, where, where, it, where the Nigerian events and atrocities came, uh, came to light in the American government, in the American press, we tried to bring, as well as the UK, we tried to bring in uh, legislation as well as uh, minutes that that showed that it was indeed an international uh, event and of course we had appendix we have an appendix of over 100 pages with incidents reports victims lists reports and more this whole document is over 300 pages and it's available online if you go to icon help you can go to the forward slash silent dash slaughter and you can find the uh, the pdf version the ebook to download uh, and that's yours free to use. If you want to purchase a physical document, that is fine. You can email me at uh, uh, the details below. Data generally. Our report uh, knew these assumptions, these basic assumptions, that when you look at data, it's, it's qualitative, it's quantitative, it refers to different types of, types of data that originates from statistics, from reports. Uh, both these types of data, the qualitative and quantitative, can be subjective or objective. 
neither is exclusive to the other. And as you know, subjective data is a condition of being a subject, quality of perspective, experiences, feelings, beliefs, desires, um, includes elements of personal interpretation and opinion. Every uh, report, every map that you see, whether it's a COVID-19 map or whether it's a, a weather map has a bit of personal interpretation to it. They want to, we want to present something that you want to see or we think you may want to see. So there's, there's always personal interpretation or opinion involved in every kind of data collection and presentation. Objective though, tends to be more uh, using accurate details, confirming what happened or what some, someone assumes happened uh, based on their eyewitness account or their perspective. Uh, objective also is attempt to uncover truths, eliminate personal biases and a priori uh, commitments uh, as well as uh, re release any sort of emotional involvement. There's also general data that's quantitative, stemming from the quantity, indicating an amount, uh, measuring something, the number, the amount, the size, the scope, the depth. Qualitative is the quality, uh, description of, indicates a description of something, subjects, properties, characteristics, features, that kind of something. Um, yeah, there's some examples if you need that, but I'm sure we are all, uh, we've all dealt with data and we've been experienced with it, so I won't go there. Importance of data, you know, the various types, implicit, complex, indicative, the various sources uh, show the, the importance of data. We, we have eyewitness accounts, we have app users, you know, using a camera or a video recorder or uh, a, an audio recorder whether it's a digital sub submission from their phone or, or using an app or, or whether it's a hard copy, whether they're taking notes and inputting based on questions, as, questions asked. And then the social media, maybe it's not an actual formal uh, uh, entry into data, but it's a, just a, uh, I'm hearing rumors that there's an attack coming right now, or please pray for me, my village is under attack, uh, witness, Overnight, 10 people died. These kind of informal things can, as well can be a source of data, whether it's text, pictorial, video, uh, audio, et cetera. The internet has many existing documents out there. If we know how to devise systems and, and programs to, to get media articles, uh, text again, pictorial, video, we can do a deep dive and get these sort of things based on, on, on programs that can retrieve data that, that exists. We can get the date, we can get the, the numbers. And, and present that as well. And of course, you can get uh, data from various organizations. We've used, in our report, we used OCLED. Uh, we've used CFR, uh, Council of Foreign Relations. We used the, the Nigerian Security Tracker, and we used the START from the University of Maryland. Ultimately, you're, you're trying to get information to extract it, to transform it, and to load it into your processing format or spreadsheet or whatever you're using, mapping software. Uh, and then storing it. So you want to extract it, take the data out, get from the various sources, the databases. You want to transform. You want to translate it from one file to another. Whether it's a, if it's a if it's a Microsoft Excel file or a Word file, you want to bring it into a, a spreadsheet or whatever. And you want to make sure the quality is maintained. You're not losing anything. Cells aren't shifting or or, or information is not shifting. Or in our case, we had several times where the dates they're reporting dates from Nigeria where they've gone day, month, year, and you're trying to transpose it into the American system where it's month, day, year. So the, often that time type of thing was, was looked at as well. And then longitude and latitude. Sometimes the latitude is first, sometimes the longitude. So transforming it so it all fits in. And then loading different things, adding the data to the target database where we used, where we used for, we tried to compile into one database and then upload that into our mapping software. So the usages of data, you know, we, we take data and you hear data analytics, you know, we've, with, with social media now on your phones and, and, and different accounts, people have more information than, they, than you realize. They have their, your, maybe your, your full name, your date of birth, sometimes they have your, your age, sometimes they have your, your choice of your preference of food and all that stuff. So data analytics is a big business now because they can target advertising to you. We can also use data analytics to examine data sets in order to find trends and draw conclusions about the information they contain. So we did that with Boko Haram. We, we focused, we, we covered all atrocities, but we focused specifically on Boko Haram and Fulani militant attacks. You, uh, you can take the data, you can give reasoning, deductive reasoning or inductive reasoning using this logical process, uh, predictive analytics, analytics sorry. 
which employs statistical techniques to data mine, predict modeling, and, and machine learning. So you can, you can set, we didn't do this, but we, we've been working with people and talking to various uh, organizations and bureaus that that's something we want to work into. It's, it's heavy on the front end. You've got to set up the systems and all the, the software to do this, but you can do predictive analysis. You can actually say, we looked at, you know, we looked over the years from, uh, you know, during the dry season from this, from October to let's say May, the tax during these months are higher every year. You know, they're, they're more than the tax during these months. So we can say, okay, this next year and the coming year, we're going to predict that there will be a tax get ready. So these kind of things are, are can be done simply, but they can, they should be done more efficiently and, 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 and coordinated with different uh, organizations and, and, and institutions to do these type of things to help prevent, to be more preventative as well. So we look at the data landscape in Nigeria where where data is supposed to be or should be, and it's not always, or it's, it's old or whatever, we'll talk about that, but there, there's limited access, it's incomplete or it's outdated often. The Nigerian Bu National Bureau of Statistics, I li list the website there, uh, it talks about the GDP, the population, crime, different things. There's also the Nigeria uh, Data Portal, which is sponsored by the African Development Bank, which has key indicators talking about health, education, childbirth, labor, uh, demographics, et cetera. But it's also talking about public order and safety, like carjackings or armed robbery or incidents of violence. But those, if you, if you look at this website, you're going to find most of it's either outdated or not even entered in at all. So the data that's required or requested is not even there. So it's, it's a good idea, but it's, it's, it's not there. It's incomplete. And then, of course, with the COVID-19 outbreak, the, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control did a fairly decent job of, of tracking, of reporting. They were always a day or two late when they, were, when, you, when they submitted their formal reports, but they were trying. Of course, it's not much to do when you're not really testing. That's my philosophy. I think Nigeria is struggling because I don't think they're testing enough for the COVID-19. So the data landscape internationally, um, there's many different uh, sources of data that, that again, what they're inputting is coming from, it's relying on other people, other networks, other organizations. World of Meter, I used that a lot when I, when I was researching Nigerian COVID-19 cases. They use the NCC, NCDC, the, the Centers for Disease Control in Nigeria. But then they also have different UN sites. They, they, it's open, I don't think it's open source, but at least they're collaborating with others. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, does similar things, uh, more towards uh, uh, labor and income and, and uh, GDP and that kind of stuff. Our world and data is another great tool, but again, it tends to be more outdated in certain spots, especially in certain things in Nigeria. But it compiles data from various projects, the UN stuff, as well as the Nigeria projects, uh, and it reports it. And then the Humanitarian uh, Data Exchange, HDX, it's a United Nations office for the coordination of humanitarian affairs, OCHA, and it, uh, it's open source and collaborative. You'll see different organizations that are members, the different organizations that supply data, that, that, that analyze it, that give feedback to it. So it's, it's good. It's, a, it's again, you're, you're at least one or two years out with certain things. You're not immediate. The more immediate ones where they, they're actually taking current events, like days of things within the last four to five days, maybe a week, is the Akladata.com, which we used, and the Council for Foreign Relations, and the start.edu from the University of Maryland. Well, they, the start one sort of stopped after 2018, but up until that time, they were pretty, uh, pretty current, up-to-date, real-time. Of course, with anything, there are deficiencies. Deficiencies in data that we've found and that you'll find as you look and research is, is that it's unreliable, it's inconsistent, it's out of date, it's often biased. It's incomplete. Um, there's lack of open source. It's not collaborative. It's uh, not just to add, but to download and use. It's not comprehensive. It's it's it only gathers certain aspects of it. it doesn't look into the full range of the full t documenting attack. It doesn't look at missing or it doesn't come back and uh, and rectify the numbers or or justify the numbers or change anything it just gives you an incident sometimes it doesn't come back and actually change the number so instead of hearing of 45 deaths on saturday you're hearing 110 but a lot of reports are still going out at 45 well 
if there's accuracy in the 110 number, that needs to be changed in all forms. Availability, it's limited online access. Uh, it's, you have limited physical reports, more so. You can't get these things printed out or, or buy them anywhere or get them mailed to you. So the online access is, is bad, but it's worse to even get a physical copy. Uh, it's un you're unable to evaluate what is available sometimes. You can't really see everything that's out there. You can't just search uh, data on atrocities. It comes in, in different things, especially coming from Nigeria. It's very limited. And obtaining basic data, you know, case in point, I just shared this, the local government boundaries, local government area boundaries in Nigeria. Each state is divided into LGA and then subsequently down to districts. You can't find mapping software to, to, to use this. It's varies. Like I downloaded the one I thought was accurate, supplied by the Nigerian government, and it was highly inaccurate compared to what other uh, things were supplying. So the inaccuracies, the inability to, to keep things up to date or have it even available are, are, are very, it's one of the deficiencies. Overall, the compilation of sources and users, the usage of data is subjective or manipulative often. Uh, narratives are derived based on preconceived ideas. We know this often with anything comes out of Kaduna State, any official report of deaths or atrocities or attacks, it's, it's even people in the State Department in the U.S. don't even listen. They don't even, if it says this is a Governor Arafai report, they won't even read it because they know it's a lie. Misinformation, uh, not verified at the scene or with local sources. So often with these data sources, you'll get, they'll cite it from a, a, an article on, online but then they won't verify it. They won't contact someone to dive deeper and say, okay, was it 10 deaths or was it 11 deaths? Was it 12? Was it 13? How many come back later? Was it actually 15 or only 10 died? So they don't dive deep. They don't, they don't verify often with those on the scene or those with the local, uh, local sources. ICON's goal and purpose. Our goal and purpose was to take um, this data, these stories, and advocate on behalf of the voiceless in Nigeria. We wanted to expose this, uh, this slaughter uh, and what needed to be done. We wanted to bring advocacy groups and individuals to work together. Uh, ICON PSJ has worked together from the beginning uh, and we wanted to work with other like-minded individuals, politicians, thought leaders, nonprofits, non-governmental organizations, and individuals as well. Uh, and we want to be solution oriented. We want to have advocacy with action. We don't just want to be saying things or, or writing reports, we want to have things change. And how we do that is, especially in the U.S., we take our reports, we submit them to the various uh, committees and departments and bureaus and say, this is something that's happening. What can we do to change it? Then they take that, they use that, they take that their reports, and hopefully things can happen like sanctions or things can happen like a reduced uh, or a reduced amount of money given as aid or, or, or more trans, uh, transparency from the, the recipient uh, on these on these aid payments uh, so we're trying to be uh, more active in our advocacy uh, advocacy advocacy with action as we say so in the remaining few minutes let's just look at a few maps and charts and uh, see how we use the data and we call this 20 years of slaughter from january 1st 2000 to january 31st you know boko haram had 43,000 deaths in the orange there uh, in Nigeria, 9,000 in the region. Uh, Fulani Herder Militant had 18,834 deaths in Nigeria, uh, just 267 in the region. The region was Benin, Cameroon, Niger. And if you want to focus specifically on, on, uh, um, well, on the states where we, we, we believe primarily Christian, uh, mostly Christian populations, Benue, Kaduna, Plateau, and Taraba, the death count. The death count is 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 just as it's it's more in those four states than any other anywhere else. There's the map showing the deaths. Christian state. The overall number of deaths is 9,733 from 2015 to 2019. But the Christian states, Kaduna, Plateau, Taraba, Benue, is 7,189. So that's my presentation. Sorry if I went a little bit long, but thank you, and I can answer any questions.